Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. And then it is a day we've never seen before and a day we'll never see again. As always, we believe it is a day to praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you do, all that you have done and all that you're going to do. Lord, we give you praise this morning. We give you glory. We give you honor. You're so worthy of the praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you this morning. Glory to your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, this is a marvelous and wonderful day. We just want to give God some praise. Welcome, everybody, to God in the Midst. Uh, radio broadcast, Get them Radio. This is your Sunday School Lesson Edition, and I am your host, Pastor Mark McCoy of New Harvest E-Church. Oh, I am excited about this lesson this morning. This lesson this morning is coming from Luke. Luke is coming from Luke, the 16th chapter. Luke, the 16th chapter. Uh, starting at verse 19, going all the way over to uh, verse 31. I, I put on the um, Facebook, and I got to fix that later. I got it as Luke 19 to 31, but it's Luke 16, verses 19 through 31. I got too excited this morning as I was putting it out. So let's go down to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for allowing us to see another one of your beautiful days. I'm, I'm down here in Harvest, Alabama, Lord, and, 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 and the sun is shining, and the, the clouds are white and bubbly. The sky is blue and beautiful. Lord, we just thank you. As the birds are flying around, chirping, and, and, and giving you all the praise. I love how the wind is blowing this morning with a nice cool breeze and, 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 and the trees are swaying from side to side, giving you praise because the, the earth recognizes, the animals recognize, and Lord, we want the, the people of your, the world, the, your children to also recognize that you're worthy of the praise. And so Lord, we thank you this day. For, for waking us up this morning. We thank you for clothing us in our right minds. We thank you for giving us a reasonable portion of health and strength. We thank you, Lord, for the activities of our limbs. We thank you for the blood running through our veins. Lord, we thank you for the air that you've given us to breathe. Lord, we just thank you this day. We got food on our table, clothes on our backs, shoes on our feet and a roof over our head, Lord. We thank you this morning because we know every good and perfect gift comes from above. It comes from you, oh God. And so we love you and we praise you this day. Thank you, Lord. We ask you now, Lord, to anoint afresh. Bless us in a marvelous and mighty way that this word today, your word, Lord, might be a word of encouragement, might be a word to strengthen someone, that it might even be a word that somebody might give their lives to you, dear Lord, those who are listening now to this broadcast and those that will be listening in the future. Now, Lord, we plead your blood over this e-church technology. We plead your blood over... Facebook. We plead your blood over YouTube. We plead your blood, the Heavenly Father, over blog talk and, and all of this internet. Let this technology, Lord, over the telephone, let this technology, God, do what you purpose for it to do, to give you glory, because that's what you put everything in this world to do, is to give you glory. Now we plead the blood of all, everyone who's listening and those who are going to be listening in the future. We plead the blood over their lives. We ask you for health, wholeness, wellness, and even wealth from the top of their heads to the sole of their feet. Lord, we plead over their homes. We plead over their families, their, their neighborhoods. Their, we, we pray for heads of protection around 
their cities, their towns, their countries, their, their world, this world, y'all. So we just ask you right now, bless, Lord, all over the world. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Oh, hallelujah. Again, our text for today comes from Luke. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. So turn your Bible with me to Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. And I'll be reading out out of a New Living Translation. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, lived in luxurious, in luxury, excuse me, every day. At, 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 at his gates was a, 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 a was laid a beggar uh, named Lazarus, covered with sores, longing to eat what fell uh, from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked, ooh, ooh, Jesus, licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side or, or as, as the King James, Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades where he was in torment and he looked up and saw far away, Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side, with Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, if you will. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Oh, send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fight. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that, that in your lifetime, you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. And, 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 oh, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all of this, between us and you is a great chasm a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Lazarus, I mean, the, the man in purple answered, then I beg you, Father, Send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, the man replied, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And Abraham said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone raised from the dead. Oh, glory, hallelujah. This morning, we're going to put a tag on this text. And it's called karma. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Karma. Karma. See, tomorrow does come. That's it. See, 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 this thing called karma. In the Bible, it's, it's, it's called you're going to reap what you sow. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever you sow, you gonna reap. That which comes up must come down. That, 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 that's, that's, that's what's going on. And that which goes down will come up. That's called karma. And you know, you know, in the world, in the world, we we have we have we have some stuff that we say about karma. And I can't say it in, in a Christian way. I'm just gonna say karma something else. <laughs> Yeah, that which goes around comes around. Karma is something else. What? 90 seconds. Oh, mercy God. What do we do today really matters. What we do today really matters. Um, Zig Ziglar, one of the motivational speakers that I love to listen to, suggests what, what, what you do today can change all of your tomorrows of your life. I'm going to read that again. What you do today can change all the tomorrows of your life. See, see, if we eat right, and I'm trying to do that, and, and we exercise, I'm trying to do that. If we eat right and exercise today, we might, we, we might not experience health problems tomorrow. It, 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 if we're careful with our spending and saving today, we may not we may not have to worry about financial security tomorrow. If we act wisely and, and not foolishly today, we may not have to concern ourselves with negative re uh, oh Lord repercussions later. It, 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 it's, it, it's, it's not living for now, it's living for later. Living for later has its rewards. However, if you adhere to living in the now, being short-sighted and, and doing as little as possible, you will also suffer those consequences. This anonymous rich man, dressed in purple, never learned his lesson. He had to go through the school of hard knocks. Unfortunately, he learned his lesson the hard way. He had all the pleasures and pleasantries of life. Still, he was blind by the light of his self-centeredness instead of displaying selflessness being materialistic cost him a blessed eternity whereas Lazarus in this story reaped a wonderful reward oh hallelujah I I I I, I I'm a I'm a fan of the movie the Lion King I, I got so many illustrations from the Lion King. I was watching it the other day, and my wife said, "Oh Lord, he's watching the Lion King again, man! What, 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 what revelation are you gonna get from the Lion King this time?" About that time, and she said that to me. My daughter came in, uh, Tina, and Tina's sitting on the couch. And she's quoting every word of the Lion King, every line, every word. So we sitting there and we laughing. And this, 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 this Lion King story has some karma in it. Because the character, Mufasa, who was king, was killed by his brother, Scar. And Scar lied and ran off the next king symbol so that Scar could become king. And Scar did not team up with the lions, but he controlled them and teamed up with the hyenas. So the hyenas and Scar destroyed the pride lane. But karma came. And Simba came back 
and Simba ended up having to 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 fight off Scar. He didn't kill him. But the hyenas killed Scar. That's called karma. <laughs> if you don't get nothing else from this lesson this day, you need to understand karma is out there and tomorrow does come. If you do good, you'll reap good. If you do bad, you're going to reap bad. That's that's what this lesson is all about. So let me let me let me give you some background stuff on this lesson. Y'all y'all say, "Boy, you didn't took 15 minutes just to get an introduction." That's the beauty of this lesson. I mean, it's just so wonderful. It's a wonderful lesson. So in this lesson, we we got these characters. We got the rich man who's dressed in purple and linen. And we're going to talk about him some more. Then we got this beggar named Lazarus who people would place him in front of the rich man's house. And then in this story, Jesus talks about this place called Hades. Hades. And Hades is also known as Shiloh. And Shiloh, uh uh-oh, am I saying that right? Shiloh, yeah, I ain't saying that right. Skip that word. I can't say it right. Silo. See, uh, mercy, God. Mercy, God. Help me pronounce this word, God. I'm sorry, y'all. I, I hate to be trying to pronounce a word that I ain't pronouncing it right. So so I'm, I'm going to open up my, my thing and make sure I say this word right. She o. Somebody came through the door and hollered, she o. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, thank you. I, I, I get it. I have a blessing like that. Uh, she, oh, <laughs> mercy. I couldn't see it right this morning. It's a place of death. And in the Old Testament, it is believed to be the region of, of, of departing spirits for those who died. It, its translation means, uh, uh, um, meaning denotes underworld and was believed to be the imminent or immediate state between death and resurrection. In Jesus' parable, it is, it's an impassable gulf, a chasm that separates the lost from the righteous. Also, also in this parable, Jesus talks about Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom is believed to be the compartment of Hades for those who die in right standing with God due to their faith and obedience to the law. And so in the in the Torah uh, of the in the in the law of Moses, a collection of, of rabbinical commentaries of the Hebrew scripture, it is mentioned as a place where the soul rests after death. It is a place of privilege for Abraham's righteous children. Oh, that's good, y'all. That that was some good information. And so, as we look at this lesson, it's in the book of Luke. And the book of Luke features more parables than any other gospel. Jesus used illustrations to convey key principles of the king of, of kingdom living. Early on in the 16th chapter of Luke, Jesus told the parable of the dishonest manager to make the point that the true that, that to be true kingdom believers, we cannot serve both God and wealth. I'm going to say that again. To be true kingdom believers, we cannot serve both God and wealth. After hearing this parable, the Pharisees, because of their own power and their own wealth, ridiculed Jesus in an attempt to discredit him. In response, he told the Pharisees that they 
were good at appearing religious, but their hearts were not. In their mind, the great wealth showed that they were blessed by God. But Jesus pointed out that they were only wealthy through dishonest gain. Jesus declared that, that the kingdom of God runs counter to the dominant culture. The Pharisees relished their wealth and power, but Jesus warned them that they fell short of God's standard. He further bruised their ego by letting them know that God reads the heart. So, it was useless to justify themselves based on their works. Last week, I got on my soapbox about how America is treating immigrants. And before the week was up, God heard my prayer and he heard others' prayer and he answered and they have changed the policy somewhat. But God is not looking on what you're doing outside. He's looking at what's going on in your heart. And I'm sorry to say that America right now is going through a stage where we think the wealthy and the healthy are the only ones who have rights. In this parable that we were getting ready to look at, Jesus is trying to tell us something. <laughs> you know that song, God is trying to tell me something. Yes, he's trying to tell us something. And so as we look at this lesson today, I, I, we're going to talk about our key concept that God's people will receive a fair reward for obeying his word. The keys to this lesson, God wants us to follow Jesus and obey his word. Next, God gives us a chance to repent and do what's right. And then the last key is God will punish those who do not obey his word. Oh, yeah, I'm laying it out because we, we need to understand that um, we're going to reap what we sow. We need to understand there is, there is karma, and tomorrow does come. And so for all of those people who who going around and saying, well, no, they're following the law and letting, putting them, separating them children from their parents because they coming into this town, coming into our country illegally, and it's the adults' fault because they did that wrong and, and the children going to have to suffer. You better watch your words because you're going to read what you saw. So as we get into this lesson, and it's, it's 926 already. I'm, I am just kind of took my time, but it, it don't take long to, to lay out this lesson because this lesson is, is, is one of those parables of Jesus that, that is so just all in your face that it tells its own story. So the first, first point that I want to bring out in this lesson is the conceit and the crumbs, the conceit and the crumbs. Listen to verses 19 through 21. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gates was, a, was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The rich man, the rich man with all his luxuries chose to see his status of wealth as a badge of privilege rather than a vessel to bless others. 
We're living in a world where people think that they're more privileged than anyone else. And so daily, daily, he dressed in, in, in lavish purple and linen. While others, like Lazarus, would have been just blessed by the crumbs from his table. And the, somebody put Lazarus there every day, testing the rich man to see if he would send his servants out and just give him the crumbs, the trash from his table. If you're a businessman or woman, and you'd rather throw stuff in the trash can than help the homeless that come by your business or your house. I'm warning you. Karma is something else. And so here it is. Although it doesn't indicate where and how this man, this rich man received his wealth. We know he flaunted it without regard to others who may have been without. This, this nameless rich man failed to recognize where his true blessings originated from. He did not grasp that every good and perfect gift comes from God, judging from the outside by his luxury, he appeared to be blessed. However, blessed are those who will lose their lives to gain the world. That's Luke chapter 9, verse 25. He had not come to the understanding that it was not about him. If he realized we are blessed to be a blessing, he could have enjoyed his life even more. Catch me. God gives us wealth and resources to bless other people. We are blessed to bless. And so, if we realize we are blessed to be a blessing, then we could enjoy our lives even more. God loves a cheerful giver. Being wealthy is not about how much stuff you have, but how big your heart is. When you share your wealth with others, you are truly a blessed person. I love, I love, I love, I'm going to tell you, I love Warren Buffett because Warren Buffett accumulates a whole lot of wealth. But Warren Buffett gives away a whole lot of wealth that he's accumulated to help the poor. I love, I love, I love uh, 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 my boy at, at, uh, that, that does uh, um, Microsoft and his name ain't jumping in my head right now, but, but uh, and it will in a little bit maybe if God so chooses. He, he's going around trying to cure various diseases and he's giving his money to the poorest people in the world. And he's establishing scholarships and things. And then let's talk about our contemporary sister, 
you know, we call her Bay Queen Bay. Yeah, Beyonce and and and, and her husband. They've established scholarships. Oh, I love, I love, I love people who 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 who've accumulated wealth, but they're making sure that others can be helped. I scratch my head sometimes because all of us go to Walmart. But I, I haven't seen Walmart give scholarships to the poorest of the poor. I, I, they might do it, but I don't know of it. They, they don't establish stuff for people. That ain't how Mr. Walton started that thing. That I don't think that's what he planned for his children to do. And it looks like, well, they might give to big causes and uh, 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 for, for other rich people, but, but I haven't seen them come down to the HBCUs and give them money. I haven't seen them going to the poor cities that can't even afford a Walmart to help those poor cities get to the point where they could even afford a Walmart. I'm just talking what I'm talking about, y'all. Being wealthy is not how much stuff you have, but it's how big your heart is. And when you share what you have with others, you are truly blessed. Sadly, Lazarus didn't have much. He, he, he would have been satisfied with the crumbs from the rich man's table. Still, he took no notice. The rich man took no notice of Lazarus. Never ignore need. We ought to never, ever ignore someone who is in need because we never know when our fortunes could change. So my sister, Pastor Helen, taught me something. She said, if you see somebody, give them something. If they if they in need, give them what you can. And then as you give it to them, that's a seed. Name that seed and watch how God would make it grow. So I walk around with, with change and cash in my pocket. And and, and, and 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 when I see somebody unfortunate and they come up and they say, can I get something? And I, I, I don't ignore them. If I'm walking around and I don't have any money in my hand, I, I'll stop and talk to them for a bit and say a word over them and pray and keep on going. But I claim it, that seed, because I planted it in the ground and I claim what I want from it. That, that's something I learned. Because I know that karma whew, will come around. I know tomorrow does come. And so, Lazarus, he's so messed up. He's so jacked up. All he wants is some crumbs. But the only thing that Lazarus has to give at this time is to give the dogs in the neighborhood pleasure by licking on his wounds. You say, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. What did you just say? Yeah. See, the old song says nobody wants you when you're down and out. Lazarus was down and out and nobody wanted him, but the dogs. When they saw him, they came by and licked his wounds. That was pleasure to them dogs to lick his wounds. I don't know how much pleasure that was or comfort it was for Lazarus, but that's all he had. So that's why I'm getting to my next point. It's called comfort and inconvenience. Listen to 23, 22 and 23. The time came when the beggar died 
And the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades, where he was in torment. He looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham. Oh, I'm going too far. Let me stop right there. <laughs> Let me stop at 23. So here it is. What we saw in my first point was a picture of two lives, a life of a rich man and the life of a poor man. Now we're looking at the life, a picture of life after death. Notice what I said a picture of life after death. And this picture shows us, and here's my point, the comfort and the inconvenience. That's my point. The comfort and the inconvenience. We learn that earthly conveniences and inconveniences have a time limit. Oh, let me make that plain to you. This too will pass. I don't care what you're going through, how good it is. It's got a time limit. It's going to pass. I don't care how bad stuff is and how much you're moaning and groaning and you're hurting. Just hold on, baby. Because this too will pass. It's got a time limit. And since we reap what we sow, there is what we call a harvest time. That's coming from Galatians chapter six, verse seven. And you know, you know how I feel about harvest time because we reap what we sow. The poor man, Lazarus died and was carried to, the, to Abraham's side, a place of blessing. And when yet, when the rich man died, he was carried away. He wasn't carried anywhere. He was buried and, 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 and transcended to Hades. His well-to-do life, once filled with polish and Prompt and circumstance was now saturated with doom and despair. No longer would he be accustomed to the finer things of life, but 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 he would have to 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 make do with the dead things of eternal death. Their worlds were reversed. Lazarus, who could only bless dogs by allowing them to lick his wound, was now living the blessed life, eternal life with God, which the, the rich man, while, while the rich man lived in torment. Lazarus seed, although delayed, still reaped the harvest of good in eternal glory. The rich man serving his own interests proved to be a poor choice for him. His conceit proved him and provided for him an eternal death of anguish. The tables were turned. Now God flaunted his best by showing him Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. 
right in front of this rich man. What are you saying, Pastor? Our actions today will matter. God's judgment will not evade anyone. You reap what you sow. Come is something else. And I want you to hear me. Tomorrow will and does come. So what have I showed you already? I've showed you in this lesson the, the, the conceit and the crumbs. And I've also talked about the comfort and the inconvenience. Now, as I get ready to close, I want to deal with the consequences and the conclusion. Let's look at verse 24 to 31. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his fingers in water and cool my tongue because I was in agony. I'm in agony in this fire. Did y'all catch that? Every time I read that, I can remember as a child, this man, this rich man, when Jesus told this story, this rich man knew who Lazarus was. So he couldn't claim ignorance. He couldn't claim, but I didn't know. No, this man knew that Lazarus was poor. This man knew that Lazarus was a beggar. This rich man knew the needs of Lazarus, but yet he ignored the needs of Lazarus. And now he has the audacity to ask Abraham, oh, Father Abraham, because he thinks he's so privileged. Father Abraham, I'm privileged. I was privileged in this world. Now I'm in hell and I'm privileged here. Send that boy down here, that poor man Lazarus, and let him dip his finger in some water and then put it on my tongue just to cool me off. That's the audacity. Audacity of people who think they're better than everybody else. Think that they're more privileged. Think that they got more rights. No, God don't play that. So here it is now. Verse 25. You dealing with your consequences, boy. That's what he's saying. Because Abraham replied and said, son, remember that in your life, you receive your good things. While Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here. And you are in agony. That's the consequence. If you go around and you ain't and you blessed and you're not trying to be a blessing to anybody don't expect any blessings from god if you going around and you think that you are all privileged and you all that in a bag of chips with some dip on the side and not ever helping anybody you're gonna reap some agony because you don't understand you sold agony. So you're going to reap some agony. And so here it is. Lazarus is now in Abraham's bosom. He suffered. He suffered on earth. I'm, I'm saying something to someone. You might be going through some suffering now. But God is looking at your heart. And that's why when you go out and you deal with homeless people or guys that have been in the jail or inmates or whatever, um, when you go out and deal with the street people, the street people treat each other better than people with money. They'll, they'll come together. Man, I got a dime today. You got a dime? Let's go get us a card and eggs. You know? Now, I, I ain't going to be, you know, trying to make poor better than rich. That ain't what I'm saying. I'm talking about the heart. 
And so I've, I've watched poor people. I, I, I know when I was poor, how we work together with one another to get ahead. And, and, and we have a problem today in society because the poor people, in some cases, don't work with each other no more because everybody think that they're rich and privileged. I started realizing that they're poor and needy. Oh, let me go on. <laughs> Verse 26. After he told them that he, the rich man, you're in agony and Lazarus is being blessed because you received what you, your good things while you were in earth and you didn't really appreciate them because you didn't share them with others. He says in verse 26, and besides all of this, between us and you is a great chasm, a, a great gulf, a, a great space that has been set in place so that those who want to go from where you are cannot, and those who want to go from where we are can't cross either. Once you go to heaven, you ain't going to hell. And once you go to hell, you ain't going to heaven. <laughs> that, that's what Lazarus said. And so, in verse 27, the rich man, he answered and said, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. This brother still in hell trying to command and tell people what to do. Have you ever seen people like that? I always think that they have the right and privilege to tell folks what to do. And so, he says, send Lazarus to talk to my family, for I have five brothers, and let him warn them so that they will not also come to the place of torment. Oh, now you got a heart. Now you're concerned about others. Now you're worried about what they're going through. But you're still just worrying about your family. You should have worried about the, your family. You should have been concerned about your family before you went to hell. You should have been concerned not only about your family, but for everybody else in the world before you went to hell. Don't, don't go to hell and start talking about send somebody back. Let me go on. Because <laughs> I'm running out of time. And he says, he says, he says, he says, he says, Abraham says, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. That's it. They got Moses and the prophet. Let them listen to them. Yeah. We, we got the word of God. You ain't got no excuse. You better repent and trust in Jesus Christ. And, and your brothers, they got to do the same thing. Repent and believe. And then this rich man in hell starts hollering back at, at Abraham. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's what Lazarus was saying. I mean, that, that, that's what Abraham said back to him in verse 31. Really? Oh, so here's the conclusion. He says to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone raised from the dead. This was a direct indictment against the Pharisees that Jesus was telling this, this parable to. They, 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 they walking around with all of this privilege. They walking around with all of this wealth, but they don't understand that they got to listen to the word of God. The, law, the word that came through Moses, the word that came through the prophets, they got to be convinced through the word because faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. And in the parable, Jesus said, Abraham said, man, look, 
they don't believe Moses and the prophets. And they will not be convinced even if someone raised from the dead. So we have still people today who don't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They don't believe that he died on the cross for your sins and my sins and the sins of the world. They don't believe that he was buried in a tomb that he just barred for three days. They don't understand and don't, they don't want to believe and they don't want to confess that Jesus got up out of that grave with all power in heaven and earth in his hands. They don't want to believe that Jesus looked at the grave and said, grave, where is your, I mean, death, where is your sting? And grave, where is your victory? They don't want to believe in that death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so somebody coming back from the dead ain't enough witness. The word of God ain't enough witness to them. The world and everything in it that God is doing is not enough witness for them. That's their choice. And I've learned that we have the free will to choose whatever we want to choose, but we can't choose the consequences. We need to choose Jesus. And I tell you, when you choose Jesus, every good and perfect gift comes from above. Which means, if you're choosing, you will have good consequences. My brothers and sisters, in the scientific world, there's a law called Newton's third law. Newton's third law of physics states that for every action, there's an equal reaction. For every action, there's an equal reaction. This means for every force, there is a, a reaction force that is equal in size, but opposite in direction. That suggests that, that whenever an object pushes another object, it gets pushed back in the opposite direction equally hard so if you were to punch your wall the harder you hit the wall the more force is inserted on your fist by the wall that's why when you bring your fist back your fist hurt imagine it 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 it, 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 it imagine if you do well in life all the good you do god is taking note he is reading himself and readying himself, excuse me, to bless you in ways that you cannot even imagine. It may not be in the way you would expect, but he will do it. Similar with the wrong that you do. The more evil you do, the more evil you will receive. Many of us today, are miffed by the many injustices we see and experience every day. Tomorrow does come. Karma is there. People who are unsavory and dishonest and uh, uh, wicked, yeah, they seem to prosper today. They won't always rest assured. God is not mine. Like the rich man, those who practice in wickedness will reap their rewards. Unfortunately for them, they may not understand this till it's too late and they're dead and gone. But we who trust in the Lord Jesus, we who plant our seeds of blessings and giving, if you sow in goodness, it's a guarantee goodness will come your way. Newton's third law is in effect. If you give, 
God says he'll give back to you. Press down, shaking together and running over. We must remain faithful in our well-doing because the kingdom harvest is ours to reap if we faint now. So I say to you, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchased above, born of his goodness and washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. I'm praising my savior all the day long. He's blessed me. He's blessed you. Now, be a blessing to others. That karma, the good karma, will come back to you. Because tomorrow is coming. Oh, hallelujah. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for blessing us, for keeping us, now, Lord, help us to be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I end this recording, I want to take this opportunity to pray with you that are listening the prayer of salvation. Please repeat this prayer after me. Dear Father God, I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus died for my sin and was buried and that you raised him from the dead. I repent of my sins. Please forgive me of my sins and come into my heart. I invite you, Jesus, to become the Lord of my life, to rule and to reign in my heart from this day forward. Please send your Holy Spirit to help me obey you and to do your will the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen. Facebook, remember, if you don't remember anything else I said in this lesson, you are blessed to be a blessing. Till next time, be blessed and be a blessing.